um, tell us who you are and what your connection is to the fair and a bit about your family history? Yeah, well, I'm a sixth generation showman. My family's been coming here since 1850 at least, and we've been travelling since 1850. Originally with horse and carts and that, and then like obviously went into the steam travel, and now it's modern way of life. But um, I'm still doing it, you know. Six generations down the line, my sister, she's having a child. Seventh generation, you know. It's I don't think there's many businesses that can trace their roots back at least seven generations coming up now, still doing exactly the same thing. Obviously modernised, but what we was doing all them years ago, you know. It's it's I'm proud of our heritage, you know. It's a way of life. It's a way of life. What was it like growing up as a child? You just do it, you know, you're not anything different, you know, it's like obviously all your friends are in the same business, you're, you're travelling around, that was my biggest, but well, I was different in the sense that we were settled, we were settled just by Cardiff and we used to commute to different fairs where a lot of my friends used to travel from fair to fair, so I was a bit of an outsider in that sense, but I had the best of both worlds, you know, I had like the settled lifestyle and the travelling lifestyle, which was really good, and when I was in school I used to say, I, I got picked on, you know, called all these names and that, but in the end it was just my job. And all I said was the difference in you and I is my job, that's all it is. So were you working on the fair at a young age? You, you learn everything, you pick it up, you know, you, you're starting, helping setting up, pulling down, picking the packing up, you're doing just little jobs and then the safest place for a child at a busy fair is in the stall. You know, you know where they are, they're, they're there with you. Or they're in the pram and you learn to count, you know, you, you work with money, you work with people, you know, there's not many businesses where you're covering so many ranges at such a young age. You know, you're doing it all from a baby and you just pick it up like subconsciously, you just do it. You don't know you're doing it, it just comes to you. Is there ever any thought of doing anything else? Um, no, because we've never known anything else, you know, it's just, it's like farming, you know, there's a big connection with showmen and farming and it's a lifestyle, it's what you do, it's the way you are, it's how you're brought up and I would love to carry on what I'm doing but then again it's modern times, you don't know what's around the corner but at the moment it's, it's a great way of life. Well, there was the hiring fairs, which was usually in like the back end of the year, it was September time, where they used to hire the workers, um, the labourers to go on the farms. And then you get the mop fairs, where you would carry a mop, where if you didn't have a trade, and then some would carry like an ear of corn on their thing, and, and then you'd have a fair then a week later, which was called the runaway mop. So if you didn't like your employer, you'd go back then a week later to get hired again, and then you'd have that, and that was then your season's work. Yeah, well, I'm Tom Smith. Um, we've been coming here for six generations, you know, right? since the 1850s. I can trace my family history back in this business alone. Um, I've come here all my life, um, literally with the same stalls that my grandfather, great grandfather, coconut shies, rifle ranges, that's what we've always done in the same business, and I'm still doing it now, exactly the same. Modern prizes, modern lights, you know, but in essence, it's exactly the same as what we was doing 150 years ago. I am, I'm really passionate about what we do, it's a way of life, you know, I've, I've been in it all my life as a child, you know, it's, you're brought up on a fairground, it's, can you imagine being a child, anything better to do than being on a fair, you've got all this lights, this music and everything around you, what any child would want really, it's, it's a fantastic way of life, it really is. Um, you know, it's been going for hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands of years, you know, started jugglers and, you know, then it went into markets and trade fairs and then it all rolled on. But the fair, as you see it today, is turn of the century, you know, 1850, steam powered, that's when the fairs really took off. But then the life of the fair was in the 1950s, you know, the music, the modern life, uh, after the war years, you know, we had lots of hard times with the war years, the 50s come along, Fashion changed, attitude changed, it was the year of the teenagers, you know, teenagers come around, it was, that was the height of the fairgrounds, it was in the 50s, 60s, that was the best times. In my dad's opinion as well, he lived there, he was there, he seen it and he said fairgrounds in the 50s, 60s was the heyday, never, they, they'll never be matched again, they, they was the, the rock and roll years. What's it like today? It's different. It's different, it's a, it's a lot harder, um, it's 
there's so much more out there. there. There's theme parks out there, there's package holidays out there, there's Xboxes, it is the I think people still enjoy a fairground. To come into their town, the local people enjoy a fairground. Um, but I think the attraction of the fair, the the charter of the fair, people don't get that. They don't know why it's here. They don't know if we just roll in town and we go again. They don't understand what we're doing here. But um, it is different. It is different. It's more the big rides now. The big rides, the frills and the spills, the side stalls make a fair. You know, you can have all the big rides but if you haven't got your candy frost your toffee apples and your side stores it's just a lot of big rides you need to have everything to fit in everything makes a fairground it, it, it's it, all little parts they all click together they all click together so what's been handed down to you in terms of skills and showmanship well showmanship is a great word it's who we are um i've been brought up with an old-fashioned way of life you know I, I'm talking to the public every day of my life I'm meeting new people I go back and then I see them grow up they see me grow up and you, you see the same families coming back time and time again but you're working with your hands you know it's a physical job you're out in all weathers you when it's sunny it's the best job in the world you know you couldn't wish to do anything better when it's pouring down a rain you think to yourself I'd love to be in an office you give yourself an hour in an office and you think, I want to be out in the rain. You know, it, it's a total way of life. You know, it's, it's like farming, you know, they go hand in hand, showmen and farmers. There's, there's so many comparisons. It's totally weather dependent. It's seasonal. You know, it's generations passed down in families. It's, there's so many similarities with the farming heritage and showmen. It's, diff it's, it's all there together. Well, as spieling, it's, it's what you've done to coax them to go on your stall. It, I'm doing it now, you know, I'm talking to you. And I'm doing it now, I, I'm giving that bit of showmanship, I'm giving a bit of a story, a bit of banter, a bit of history. And that's what you have to do, to get them to come onto your stall. You know, you roll up, roll up, give it a go, three balls for a penny and all that. That's what you've got to do. But if you don't, they just walk past you and go to the stall next to you. You've got to give them a reason to come and have a go on your stall. Where did you learn that skill from? I don't think you learn it, it's ingrained in you, it's just there, you know, I see my dad do it, I see my grandfather do it, and then you learn yourself, you know, you be putting your own little spin onto things, you, you know, my father might say it this way and I will say it a different way, you know, but in a, it's all the same, you know, you just got to try and <laughs> get every penny out of them you can, you know, you, you're there, it's your business at the end of the day, you know, you're there as a job, you've got to earn your money. Yeah, it's a great saying. It's not the show that gets the dough, it's the flash that gets the cash, which is you, you need to have the best lights, the best prizes, all of that. You need to get the best fronts on the shows with all your signage and the parading girls on the front of the shows to attract people in. And once you've got your money off them, you can do what you like then. You know, you can have absolutely nothing at all inside. You know, it can be the most trivial, the most menial thing, whatever inside, but you've had the money, that's it, next please. You know, so once they're in, they're coming out the door at the back and that's it, but you've had the money. You've got to get them in. That's the main thing is to get them there. It's rife. It's like any business, you know. You look down this line now and there's so many of the same thing, you know. There's there's so many hooker duck stores, there's so many shooting stores, it's all the same. So again, you've got to work at it to get them to go on your stall. And it's healthy to have a bit of competition. If you had it all on your own, you know, you'd just get lazy and it'd just be old hat. It's healthy to have competition. You've got to be one step ahead of the game. You've got to have the newest thing, the newest prize. The, you've got to be top of the market. You know, it's, it's like any business. If you let yourself slack, then someone's going to step in front of you and they're going to have it. So we were talking before about the old days when we had the dancing girls and yes. things. Uh, live entertainment. Uh, you were talking about <laughs> yeah, especially with like the, the parading shows as we call them, with like the dancing girls on the front and if there was going to be a line of say four or five of them in the same fair, they had to do something different to get the public to come to them. So if it was quiet, they would literally, they would go all the way, you know, they, they, they'd like I said, they, they'd have nothing on but a smile, you know, and they'd literally go down to nothing and the fan dance you know sometimes you move their fans a little bit slower so you get a little bit more of an eyeful and it, 
then the word will go around and they say, oh, don't go to them, they aren't too good. Go to the store next to them, they give you a better show. And it's, you know, it's in and out. You've got to try and get them in, in and out as fast as you can, but give them what they want as well. It is. It's, it's that's where it, it's burlesque. It's the can can. It's it's like the pole dancing nowadays. You know that's what it is. But in a travelling show that you just went from village to village to village. It, it's so it's it's like a burlesque show. Instead of being in like the Moulin Rouge, then it was the Moulin Rouge that went to your village. So once a year you'd be seeing some beautiful women doing their thing in your village. But you described before um, the picture of. A, a, like the, the show arriving in town, the bright lights, playing music of the day. Can you describe that to us? Well, yeah, well, I, I'm from South Wales. So the South Wales Valleys, you know, hard working, coal mining, all, they, they'd have their one, their miners fortnight and a fair. That would be their two highlights of the year. And when the fair would roll in town, as you can only, well, I don't think you can imagine it because we, we I can't get my head around it, to see a traction engine, three or four trucks behind it, rolling into your town. And the, the villagers knew when we was coming they knew our dates they would be like oh like now Harry for Mayfair you know it's the Tuesday Wednesday Thursday after the bank holiday they know that's when it's coming and they'd be there and they'd be waiting and my dad said they can remember the kids following you to go to the site where you'd be they'd be oh they and then they'd be helping you set up because they wanted to help it was we was an outcast they wanted us there and it was the first time electric lights on a fairground you know modern music on a fairground um, it was it was cutting edge it was cutting edge even to today you know there's things led lights you know it's the best music going it's on a fairground still we're still at the top of the game we're still there what about um, uh, pre-internet days talked about um, music stars of the day would bring their music yeah so especially in the 50s um with records you know the 45s they'd be there and they'd bring them onto fairgrounds and they'd hand them out to the rides for to get their name out there you know and they'd be dancing in the street literally dancing in the streets listening to the music so it was free entertainment you could come to a fairground you wouldn't have to spend a penny but you'd have a great time you'd, you'd have all the top music all the rock and roll music would be there at the fairground 50s and 60s as i said was the height of fairgrounds that was he was living life, you know, it was after the war, he was having a great time, but, you know, they would they would hand out these records and then if they wasn't dancing to them, they would stand there and look and they'd see how people would react to them and they'd say, oh, we need a bit more of this or a bit less of that and that's how they would gauge audience. Nowadays, it'll all be in a review, you know, give us a review, like, yes, no, like, when in the day they had to be there to see it and that, that's why they done it. So, how old are you, Tom? 28. Um, big changes. I remember when I was young, six, seven, Harryford was my favourite fair of the year. I used to always love coming to Harryford. And even now, we wouldn't be talking doing this now at two o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon. This is fair day, you know. This is when it should be. The street should be busting, you know. The people should be here. The cattle market's gone out of town. Even in my days, I remember you see the farmers coming into the town and you knew they was here for the cattle market. But my dad, he'd be open at eight o'clock in the morning as of today, taking money. And then the police would have to come and close you at 12 o'clock at night because the people were still out. They were still here. Rain, snow or blow, they would be out. You'd be taking money. And that's what, you know, it's changed. It's changed. You look down here now at 2 o'clock. It's, it's totally changed. But there's so much more out there for people now. You know, there, there is the theme parks and the holidays. It's out there. It's the fair, especially Hereford. You go to any town, you go to any big town, you know, there was Ludlow last week, you know, they're all, they're not dying. The fair will never die. They've got to diversify. They've got to change to meet the market. We, it's a teenage fair now, you know, the family people, we'll get them after school, we'll get them for a couple of hours and then they're gone again. But they're not, they're not hanging around. They seem to be money, they've only got so much money to spend. So they'll come out, they'll spend their certain amount of money and they're gone. Where years ago, they would save for the fair. They'd have their, their fair money and then the granny would give them some money and the granddad would give them some money. And don't get me wrong, it was cheaper in those days. The expenses wasn't there as what we've got now. You know, it costs a fortune just to operate. You know, the days of six months ago or a penny on the ride, it, it, you can go out with a shilling and have a full day of fun and go home with a toffee apple and a cuddly toy. Now, I can totally appreciate it, you know, I can see both sides of the coin. I can understand money's hard, you know, it's hard to earn money, but 
you've got to have a bit of fun with it as well. You know, if it's all work and no play, you've got to have a bit of fun with it. Do you, I mean, how long have you been coming to Harryford? All my life. All my life. So the first time I would have come to Harryford, I would have been three months old. You know, so it's literally, you're in it. And we would have been in the stall, in the pram, in the corner of the stall. You see my friends up there now, they're doing it, the next generation. They're prams. We, if, I don't know if you've seen them around. We always have the big silver cross prams. And people say, why have you got such big prams? They must be a burden towards you. But the kids are in the prams. That's where they are. You know where they are. They're in the stall with you. They're safe. And these prams, they're huge. So you put their toys in there and everything, a bit of food, and they're safe. That's what they're doing. So this is when you learn the business. You're... You're doing it subconsciously, you know, it's all going on around you, you know what you're doing, setting up and pulling down, you're there with your parents, you're doing it. So, you never sat down at home and they're like, right, today you're going to learn how to build this ride up, today you're going to learn how to do this tour. You just do it, you're there and that, you're learning it without learning it, it's just around you, it's just there. Yeah, it's so 900, 900 years. years. Yeah. Okay, so that's a long time. Mm -hmm. How important is it that the, 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 the stories of people from the Showman's Guild, people like you, people like Emily, are recorded? I think you've missed a generation. It's great to do it now, but it's second-hand stories, it's third-hand stories. I'm telling you what my parents and grandparents has told me or told me but if you would have had it firsthand at the time off of them it's stories that and it doesn't have to be a story it can just be a conversation and you can pick little things out of this conversation that you can think is great but it's just everyday life to us but I do think you've missed the time my generation, I can guarantee you now, if you go and ask other people in this business, my generation, the stories won't be there. Not what I know. But they'll have their own stories, which is still great, but not the old stories. Not what their grandparents done and their great-grandparents done and the history of our business. I think they've lost that. I think they've lost that. But it's modern way of life. You know, they're, they're modernising as much as everything else. But my history, I'm so passionate about it. I love what I do. So... I try to keep it alive, you know, I love, to, I love to educate people in what we do. If I get in a pub somewhere and I can see there's a bit of something going on and they, they do talk about us, you know, we are still outsiders, we you know, but then I guarantee you by the end of the night I could completely turn them around and then they've got what we are, they know who we are, they understand why we're here. We're not just rolling into a town, taking their money and going. We're here for a reason, it's been going for 900 years, you know, that, that's why we're here. Totally, totally, because I don't know if I'm going to be here in another 10 years. So I, I'd love to think my children and take it on and be the seventh generation in the business. But then if I'm not, that's finished. You know, that, that's game stop. And it's happened so many times. And, you know, showmen don't retire, they die. And it's as simple as that. You know, like my father, he's 72. My grandma was 96 and he was still in the fears, still working till he was 96. And you've got to document it. We can talk all day long. You asked us, give us a pen and paper, put it down. We do it in a roundabout way, but it would never be the same as just talking on a camera or recording it. It's, it's free and easy doing it now. It, this is how we like to do it. You know, you just talk and you pick little things up. But I don't, we're not uneducated people. We're not uneducated people. But the older generation, my parents' generation, pen and paper wasn't so good. Money, they tie you in knots with money. Business tie you in knots with business. But and again, to talk to you, they can have a conversation with you, like the Queen, you know, not a problem, but to pen and paper, we was travelling, you know, we, my dad used to leave the yard in March, come home the end of September, he used to go to about 20 different schools, you know, a little boy, 20 different schools, and all he would be done, put in the back of the classroom, just because you're there, and that's it. it, it it's, it's hard, but now we have travelling schools, you know, we, we're as liable as anyone else to, for education, so if we don't do it, our parents, they, they're 
they're the ones at risk with being fined and everything else. So even I remember at Hereford, and I don't see it now, but we used to have a travelling school, you used to come to Hereford and you had to do your schoolwork before you come and open. You know, they, they, the school would give you packs, work packs to take away. Now this is only a three day fair, but when you go to the likes of Newcastle, Nottingham and that, when they're like two and three weeks long, they go there and there'd be classrooms and they'd be in there. So they, they're doing their education, but on site. So it wouldn't be in the uniforms and whatever, but then they go home and then they'd be straight into our business. A 10 year old, you know, they're working. So it, it's good, it is good. And education's paramount and you've got to have education, but you didn't want to do it. You wanted to be working, you know, you wanted to be out, you wanted to be out with your friends and you didn't want to be doing it, but you had to do it and you knew you had to do it. Is there anything particularly special about coming to Hereford? I like the nostalgia, as I said, like my family's coming here for six generations. So I like the fact to say that where we are in this street is my grandfather done exactly the same thing here. It's the kettle up there, my dad used to tell me when they used to bring the lorries in, he used to stand on top of the lorry and unhook the little kettle and look inside that teapot, you know. And my dad's 72, so that's like 70 years ago he was doing that. And every time I pull into Hereford, every time I look at that and that goes through my head, every single time. Seacombs, the shop that used to be behind here, we've got a piece of board which is built into one of the stalls, which was out of the blinds in the front of the shop. And we've we still got that, and that's Hereford history, what we've still got. So um, it's like th they bought a Spitfire in the Second World War, you know, showman club together, and they bought a Spitfire, and it's called All the Fun of the Fear, and it's documented. And they're, in the First World War, they bought ambulances, they bought beds for the hospitals. Um, what we used to do, you know, we'd have fairs where the first day of the fair, they call them hospital fairs, and they'd, they'd have a day of opening and give the money to like a local hospital. Down in Swansea, you know, there, there was um, Jacob Studd. He built wings in hospitals, you know, and that's, a, you know, that's millions of pounds you can imagine. And that's what he done, to give back to the community. As much as we're here and we're taking, we're giving back to the community as well. We're making these memories. But it's, it's always fears of a hub, you know. They, they was there, people come into town. Marriages that's happened at fairs. Becomings, you know, people would meet, they, they, then they'd meet at the fair next year. And it's happened many times, you know, people, it's memories, you know, and you see kids bringing their kids and then their families growing up and then their kids. And we used to come here with my granny and my granny's not here now, and, but I remember doing this with my grandfather. It's, that's what it is. But the history of fears, they go, well, they, they're never ending. They're never ending. And I don't think they are going to end. I don't think they are going to end. But then, again, in the war years, there was, they'd use the steam traction engines then for demolishing. So they'd... The government would just take the engines, you know, they'd, they'd um, what's the word, they'd, like, compulsory purchase them, they'd just take them, and they'd use them for pulling down the towns and that, and there's loads of photos of showman's engines with still all the lights on it, and the dynamos on the front, and all sign written, just pulling down buildings in the middle of Swansea, it's, and, it, again, it's showman, we used to have blackout fairs, they used to have fairs in the war for the, um, they used to call them holidays at home. So, and uh, they literally, so imagine the Walson now, for instance, it would have been the Noah's Ark, and they'd put all like blackout canvases all around, so you wouldn't see any lights, but the fair would still be going. And it, it was for, um, to give them a boost, you know, to, to keep the morale going. But is there an element of, you know, showing being outside of the and then therefore you know, No, we seem to be in an outsider. Uh, we're a closed community, you know, and it has been said before, you know, we, we intermarry, we, we, we all do all this going on. We was, we're like the royal family, you know. We, 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 we don't tend to marry outside, only because it's such a hard business to be in. I couldn't expect someone from a, a normal family to come into this business to do what we're doing. You know, it's ridiculous hours. If it pours down the rain, you aren't earning any money. So yeah, we, we talk about it in our own communities, you know, and m my great uncle, my great uncle, he was in the Second World War, you know, he was, a, he was a sergeant major. And, you know, he loved the army, he'd done it, and he made the army his career. And m on my mother's side, his grandfather was in the First World War, and there was five brothers and two brother-in-laws went to France, and they, all seven come home. You know, it, it, we've, but the average person wouldn't know that unless we taught, there are books out there, there's books called Fairgrounds at War, and they cover the wars and that, but 
unless you talk to people, they aren't going to know. And to record it now, and it's going to be there on file, to go back in 50 years' time, it is great that someone can look at it again. Um, yes, yeah, we, we aren't getting the family people now, we're getting, we're getting um, teenagers, we're, we're getting, especially with Harryford, there's the foreigners, a lot of foreign families in town, and they're good spenders, they like a good time, they come out, because they have fairs in their own countries as well, so they're living a bit of their history back home, so the, the, the customer base has changed, but it's so quick as well, they're here and they're gone, you've got to try and get what you can, when you can.